Good morning. Everybody doing well? You fighting the cold? No? It's not that cold. You don't know anything. You're from Arkansas. I do know that I bought a snowblower. How about that? I bought a big one too, and I bought some boots to go with it. Golf shoes. All right. I picked around with Pastor Glenn. I got on Facebook and I, I tagged him in a post that I had uh, said about golf shoes. So he said, don't hate on the golf shoes. He said, that's good for about a good two inches of snow. He said, beyond that, you're not going to do much good with the golf shoes. So I don't have any golf shoes, but I do have some manly boots. Yeah. <laughs> we've been in the middle of this series that we started last week called The Missing Piece. And we've been talking about the missing pieces of our lives, how we need to allow God to put the right pieces in place in our life. And today we're going to talk about those right pieces. We're going to talk about the right things putting in our lives to make the picture complete. Have you ever put a puzzle together before and maybe at a certain point it seemed like there was a piece that fit, but you realized it wasn't the right piece? Maybe you took a piece and, and it looked like the right shape. The little, uh, the little thing on the end fit into the hole, but it just didn't look right. And you knew, even though it was able to kind of slide in there, that it really wasn't the piece that was supposed to go there. You knew that there was something else that was supposed to go, so you took it out. And you may have done that again. And, and, and you keep putting these different pieces in there that look like they're going to fit, but it's just not the right piece. There's a lot of things in our lives that we try to put in to complete the picture, to try to put in as uh, something that will help us to better see what God has for us or to see what true happiness is or to see what true love is or to see what true peace is. We try to put these different things in our lives to complete that picture. But unless you put the right pieces in the right place, the picture is always going to be incomplete. So this morning, I want to talk about the right pieces, those key elements that we need to have in our lives that are going to help us grow in our relationship with God, our relationship with one another, and as Christians. You know, there's always people that are always trying to fill long-term gaps, long-term emptiness with temporary fixes, temporary solutions. I remember a guy that I knew that, man, whenever I think about him, it just really even brings a heaviness on my heart just because I love this guy so much. He was in my youth group whenever I first started out in youth ministry. And this guy, he was just loving the Lord. He was living for God. He was doing really well, but he had some empty places in his life. And he tried to fill them with different things. He got messed up in alcohol and sex at a very, very young age. And he started drinking and he started uh, just going out and sleeping around. But he would always come back to me and treat me almost like I were a priest. And he would confess all of his sins to me and tell me all the wrong things that he had done. He was always real honest. I could always ask him. I would say, have you been doing this? Have you been doing that? And I know that he would give me an honest answer. But the fact, the, the fact of the matter is, is that no matter how much I tried to spend time with him and help him, it was ultimately his poor decisions of trying to place something in his life instead of putting the right things in there that he always came up with an incomplete picture. He always felt like something was missing or something was incomplete because he wasn't filling his life with the right things. It was that temporary solution, that temporary fix, instead of looking at the long-term picture, instead of looking at the big picture. How many of you know that God sees the big picture? He sees the big picture. You and I sometimes are short-sighted. We can only see our immediate need. We can only see getting this immediate problem fixed. That's all we see is this thing that's just screaming at us, this thing that's right in front of our face, and so we think, but I got to fix that. And we don't think long-term, and if we can just get relief from that problem, we think everything's going to be better. But we're not implementing the long-term solutions by putting the right pieces in the right place, and so the picture is never really complete, just like this guy, because he always crumpled under the pressure. He always crumpled under the pressure because there were people in his life that he needed, frankly, just to get away from. Because every time he would get around this certain group of people, he would start acting just like them, and he would start doing the same stupid things that they did. And it was bringing a temporary fix, a temporary happiness, a temporary sense of acceptance and love. 
and not looking long term. You know, speaking about pressure, it's a funny thing because whenever pressure is on, it really brings out who you are. It really brings out what's on the inside of you whenever the pressure is put on. You see, pressure exposes our need for maturity in the weak areas of our lives. It exposes our emptiness. It exposes our incompleteness. It exposes what's missing. Because whenever the pressure is put on, how you act, how you react to that pressure is going to expose what's really on the inside of you and how much pressure you can withstand. How much pressure can you withstand before you break? How, how, many ta- how slow does that guy have to go in front of you before you get mad? <laughs> and it exposes a weakness in your life. How many times do you have to get cut off before you get creative with hand gestures? <laughs> how, how many times does your kid have to say, Mama, 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 before you go, What? <laughs> how many times does the boss have to come down on you before you finally get frustrated and you say, I'm done with this? You see, we all have our limits. We all have these areas of our lives that need to be strengthened for us to react the way that God would have us to react because it shows our level of maturity. And how many of you know that we all, somebody say we all, all. need to grow? Every one of us, we all need to grow. We're not at some place of perfection. I think that there wasn't anybody that was walking on water in the bathtub this morning, right? Everybody is a little imperfect, right? We all have areas in our lives that need to change. And because of that, the first step to growth and growing and maturing in your relationship with God is recognizing that I need to grow. It doesn't matter how long you've been saved. It doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian, how long you've been coming to church. We all need to recognize the need for change and the need for growth in our lives. But it's more important than recognizing the need for change is making sure we implement the right changes and the right things in our lives. We put the right pieces in the right places. Turn over to Matthew 12 and 34. I'll show you something that Jesus Jesus taught about pressure. Matthew 12 and verse 34, Jesus is speaking to the religious leaders, the Pharisees. He tells them, you brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. That means the abundance, that means whatever's in me the most, whatever's affecting me, whatever's influencing me the most, that's what's going to come out of my life, out of my mouth. How many of you are ever around folks that all they do is talk negative, 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 negative? Every other word out of their mouth is negative. I remember there were some friends of ours years ago that uh, uh, my friend's wife always had problems with her food every restaurant that she went to. And she began to say, every Everywhere I go, they never get my food right. It's either too cold, it's too hot, it's not salty enough, it's not fixed right, it's not fixed the special way I prepared it. So I just go everywhere expecting for my food to be wrong. And I guarantee you, almost every single time, this lady's food was wrong. And it was so frustrating because it took maybe a 45 minute to an hour long dinner experience and made it like an hour and a half long dinner experience because her food was never right. She was always negative, and she was always complaining. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. That means whatever's in me the most is going to come out. But here's the deal. One of the fastest ways to see the incomplete or weak areas in our lives is to simply listen to what we say. If you can simply listen to the things that we allow out of our mouth. You know the Bible says that even a fool seems wise whenever he shuts his mouth. That's the scripture. It says that even a goofy person, a foolish person, they seem like they're really wise whenever they shut their mouth. I remember whenever I was pastor in in Arkansas that uh, we had this one board member that would remain silent. And at the very end of a board meeting, everybody would look to him to see what he had to say. He didn't say anything the entire board meeting. And then he would open his mouth and lights would shine and smoke would enter the room and music would start to play. Oh, he is about to speak. He is speaking. 
And it seems so wise. Why did it seem wise? Sometimes it was, maybe sometimes it wasn't. But why did it seem wise? Because he didn't go around just running his mouth all the time. He was a guy of few words. You see, that's what the Bible's talking about, but it's out of the abundance. Whatever's in me the most, that's what's going to come out, and you'll immediately begin to see the weak and incomplete areas in your life whenever you listen to what you're saying. What are the type of conversations that I get into? What are the things that I enjoy talking about? Who are the people that I enjoy talking about these things with? You see, a lot of times whenever the pressure is put on, we run to somebody and we want to tell them about how wrong things are and what we're really looking for is someone to agree with us because it justifies the way we feel. And guess what it does? It only strengthens your position. It only makes you stronger. But what does it do? It even greater exposes the incompleteness. It even greater exposes the gap, the wrong piece of the puzzle it exposes it and it shows our weakness and it shows our, our need for maturity and it shows our need for change in our lives. You see, too many times when the pressure is on, ugly things come out. Ugly things come out when the pressure is on. Gossip, lies, hateful words, these things come out of our mouths whenever the pressure is on or something in our lives happens that we don't like and we have no control over. These things come out of our mouth. Why? Why? Because there's abundance of those things in my heart. And they're the wrong things, the wrong pieces that I'm allowing to come out of my mouth that could cause a lot of damage. You see, when you run to others and you share those feelings sometimes, those words get more justified because of agreement. The Bible says that there's power in agreement. And that means there's power in agreement for good things and there's power in agreement for evil things. You know that? You ever talk to somebody and, boy, you was mad. I mean, I'm mad. I'm going to go talk to them. And you talk to them and they get mad with you and you're both just mad and you can't do anything about it, but you're just mad. Oh, and you just feel so passionate and angry. What are you doing? You're putting the wrong pieces in your life to make you feel complete, to make you feel justified, to make you feel better. And all it did was make that bitterness, that anger, that frustration, whatever it is, grow even deeper roots in your life and it shows our need to grow it shows our need of a weak area in our lives you see because how we react towards pressure is always in direct proportion to our level of maturity oh that was good i like the way that even sounded coming out of my mouth that sounds smart (laughs) let me say that again (laughs) i said how we react towards pressure is in direct proportion to our level of of maturity. That's number two in your notes. How we react to that pressure is in direct proportion to our level of maturity. Because there's going to be pressure come in life, whether you like it or not. The pressure is going to come on. Some of you, the pressure may be on right now. Some of you, you may be in, in just surrounded by constant pressure. Pressure will make you lose sleep. Pressure will make you treat your spouse and your kids bad. Pressure will make you mad at God. Pressure will drive division between relationships. Pressure will make you act foolishly. Pressure will mess you up if you don't react and respond to it properly, the way that God would have us to react and respond. Because whatever is in you the most, when the pressure is on, it's going to come out. Whenever I was, whenever my wife and I were having our, our twin girls, one of our twins, Abigail, she was born with group B strep. And if you don't know what that is, that's uh, sepsis, which is a blood disease. It's pneumonia and meningitis all in one. And she got that from birth. And she quit breathing on us probably uh, just a few days after, after having her home. And it was just by happenstance even that we were awake because we were supposed to be at an appointment. We happened to be up early that morning, and she turned gray. And whenever she turned gray, we freaked out. We jumped in the car, and I drove faster than I've ever driven in my life. I was pulling some of that redneck NASCAR stuff <laughs> down the road, driving in the median. I was doing some awesome driving, honking at people, you know. And she had to be flown to Little Rock to the children's hospital, and they didn't know if she was going to live or die. She lived in the neonatal ICU there in Little Rock for over a month, and we had a little camper trailer that we lived in in Little Rock during this time. And 
it was during that time that my faith was shaken because I didn't know what was going to happen and I was afraid and I was fearing. God, what is going on? I had moved to Texas at the time to plant a church. I'm mad at God. I'm going, God, I'm here to plant this church. I'm here to do your work. What in the world is going on? But then something rose up within me, folks. Something rose up within me, and I'm going to tell you this, and I want you to remember this. Up until this point, we had been praying for good doctor's reports. And I'm not knocking you if you pray that way. I just choose not to pray that way. I don't pray for good doctor's reports. And I'll tell you why. Because every time we prayed for a good doctor's report, the exact opposite would happen. There were two types of meningitis. There was one that was okay, that wasn't as bad. Then there was one that's severe. We'll, we'll know something tomorrow after these spinal taps. Okay, well, let's pray that it's not the bad kind. Guess what, folks? It was the bad kind. There's this type of thing that's going to happen and this type of thing that's going to happen. Let's pray against that. Let's pray that, that, that it's not this. And it ended up being the worst of the two every time. And my faith was getting crushed and destroyed because I'm going, what's going on? And then the Lord just corrected me and straightened me out right in that moment and he said Derek you're putting your faith in the doctor's report because every time the doctor's report isn't what you want to hear your faith gets destroyed you need to put your faith in something more solid and more reliable than the doctor's report and so guess what began to happen these things that had been invested in me from a child the word of God that had been invested in me my trust in the Lord how he had proven himself began to bubble up and begin to rise up and I began to say nope this is where I stand. This is what I believe by the stripes that Jesus paid on his back on the cross. Uh, she is healed. I'm going to stand on the truth. I'm going to stand on the word. I'm going to believe what God says, no matter what the doctor's report say. My faith is in God, not in the doctor's. And that's where I stood. That's where I began to believe. And I began to tell everybody else, we're not praying for good doctor's reports anymore. I'm thanking God. I'm praising God now. The doctor pulls me and my wife out into the hall. He says, your daughter is never going to be able to walk. She's never going to be able to talk. She's never going to be able to make eye contact. She's never going to be able to do all of these things. She's going to have all of these issues. And he said, I'm so sorry. He said, we've done all that we can do. We're going to send her on to another hospital and let her finish out her meds. Then we'll send her home with you. And he said, but sometimes there could be a chance that something could happen and that something could change. He said, I've seen all kinds of miracles. He said, so I'm not going to limit anything. I said, well, that's fine. And here we heard this news, but I stood where I stood. I said, you know what? This is on the inside of me. This has been brought on the inside of me. The pressure was on, folks. But I allowed the word of God to rise up and I stood firm. And then it was two years after that that we had went back to the neurologist and she had had an MRI and we went to go hear the results. And he said, there's no problems here. Her brain has actually grown and developed around all the damage. She should grow up and be a perfectly normal little girl and have no issue at all. Now, here's the thing. Whenever I heard that doctor's report, I could have walked out of there screaming and shouting and praising and thanking God, but I didn't because I was thanking and praising God whenever I stood on his word two years ago when he told me that by the stripes that were on Jesus' back that she was healed. That's where I stood. My faith was in God. I was thankful to hear the doctor's report, but when the pressure was on, what was on the inside of me came out, and I chose to trust in God and not in man. I chose to trust in him. It's the pressure. It's those hard times. It's those difficult times. It's the hard things. What are you going to do? What are you going to do when things don't work out the way you thought they should? Are you still going to trust God or are you going to throw your hands up in the air and give up because it didn't work out the way you thought it should work out? We've got to trust God. You see, our reaction towards this pressure is going to be in direct proportion to our level of maturity and our growth and our walk with God. This is why it is so important, folks, that you and I grow in our relationship with God and we grow in understanding and applying His Word because what are you going to stand on when the pressure is on? What are you going to stand on whenever things are out of your realm of control? What are you going to trust in? How are you going to react whenever you hear that unsettling news? How are you going to react whenever something happens to you or someone does something to you? How are you going to respond? What are you going to, what's going to come out of your mouth? Whatever's in your heart the most. So what are you putting in your heart? Are you growing 
in your understanding of God's word and of who he is because that's the only thing that I know, folks, that's worth standing on during any time of trial or pressure. Hello. I said that's the only thing that I know that's worth standing on during any time of trial or pressure because it's the only thing that's unchanging. My emotions change. My circumstances, they change. But guess what doesn't change? God's hand, God's word, God's truth. That's the only thing that does not change. And that's what I need to stand on, that solid rock that I stand on, that I choose to build my life upon. That's the right piece to put in my life. And if I continually put those right pieces into place, then whenever the pressure is put on, the picture is still complete. The circle is not broken. I'm still standing firm regardless of how I feel, what others may say, what the circumstance may look like. I've made my decision to stand upon God's word and trust in him. Amen? Because that's the only one worthy of our trust. Here's the thing. That whatever is in us the most is going to come out because immature actions are based on, uh, whatever is in you the most is going to come out because immature actions are based on feeling. They're based on what I feel. They're based on the circumstance. Immature actions are based on feeling. That's why whenever you make decisions based on just simply how you feel at the time, a lot of times we've made goofy decisions because we've reacted or acted on what we felt. We've said foolish things based on how we feel. I know nobody has ever done that in their relationship with their spouse. Nobody's ever said anything negative or ugly towards their spouse because they were just caught up in the moment. Isn't that what we say? Isn't that our excuse? I was just caught up in the moment. You know I didn't mean to say that. Yeah, I know you didn't mean to say that, but you were making decisions and choices at the time based on how you felt and your feelings. Those things... That's how immaturity works. But maturity makes decisions based on principle. 2 Corinthians 5 and 7 says, For we walk by faith and not by sight. The Amplified Bible reads it like this. We walk by faith, we regulate our lives, and conduct ourselves by our conviction or our belief respecting man's relationship to God and divine things. With trust and holy fervor, therefore we walk not by sight or appearance. You see, the Bible tells us to walk by what? Tells us to walk by faith and not by sight, not by the way things appear, not by the appearance, not by the feeling, not by the pressure. Don't walk, don't be led by those things. Walk by faith and trust in God and his unchanging hand. Walk by faith and not by sight. Well, that's great, Pastor Derek, but how do I get faith? Romans 10 and 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God of God. That's where faith comes from. So if I'm supposed to walk by faith and not by sight, I need to know how to get faith. I get faith through learning to trust God, through understanding who he is, through understanding and hearing, digesting, investing his word in my heart. You see, I can only stand, I can only understand God by his word, and that builds my faith And you know what else it does? It builds my maturity as a Christ follower the more I understand and apply his word to my life. Because immaturity is always self-conscious. Somebody say self. You see, immaturity is always self-conscious, but let me tell you, maturity is always God-conscious. It's always aware of what God said. Because immaturity is always aware of self. Immaturity is always aware of how I feel, what I think, what I want. I, I, I. That's what immaturity is always aware of itself. It's always self-conscious, but maturity is always conscious of what did God say. Maturity is always aware of what God wants and what he thinks. Because growing and maturing in our relationship with God is a process. And that's something that we as believers, we, we don't like. We don't like that word. That's almost a cuss word to us, process. Ugh. We want everything now, 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 bam, 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 microwave. I want it now. If it didn't work because I went out and did what the pastor told me to do and it didn't happen within 24 hours, well, why try? Throw my hands up in the air. Ah, it just didn't work. There's nothing to it. 
You see, we don't like this process. We don't like this changing stuff. We don't like this growing stuff. We want everything to be instantaneous. Let me tell you, folks, there is no drive through window with God where he's just going to magically fix everything and give you some change to go and tell you, have a nice day. This thing is a process. This is something you and I are continually growing in. Because how many of you have ever even recognized in your own life that the older you get, whenever you were younger and you thought you were really smart, you were really dumb? I thought I was really smart back then. No, I was an idiot. I'm pretty smart now, though. And then 10 years go by, I was really dumb then, but I thought I was smart. And then 10 years go by, and then you say, I was really dumb then, but I'm smart now. And then on your deathbed, you go, well, I, I, I don't know anything at all. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> we're always growing and we're always changing. That's why we can't allow pride to take seat and take root in our heart and in our lives. And we think that we've arrived as a, as a Christian and as a believer. Oh, I'm so super spiritual. And we think we've just got it all together. And everybody else is, well, you know. They're just still pilgrims on a journey. But I've graduated. I've got a name tag with a star on it. I'm Christian of the month. (laughs) You see, it's not where you get somewhere where you arrive and you're better than everybody. All of us, all of us, all of us are growing. And we're all in this process. And that means there's those areas in our lives that still need to be growing and changing and conforming to God's word and what he has for our lives. You see, you don't get to call yourself a mature believer based on how long you've been a Christian. You get to call yourself a mature believer based on the fruit that you produce in your life. Not based on the fact that you've been saved for 50 years. It's not about length and tenure. This isn't something where you grow and you move up the corporate ladder of Christianity. This is something where you grow in your walk and your relationship with God. And as you grow in maturity, the fruit should be able to tell all that needs to be told. Bible says that a tree is known by its fruit. Either call the tree good and the fruit good or call the tree bad and the fruit bad. Either way, Jesus said, a tree is known by its fruit. You see, what are we producing in our lives? Are we growing as a believer or do we just get stuck? Let me show you something here in Ephesians chapter 4. Everybody doing okay? All right. Good, because I'm going to keep preaching either way. (laughs) Ephesians 4, and we're going to read in verse 8. Ephesians 4 and 8 says, Therefore he says, When he ascended on high, he led captivity captive, and he gave gifts to men. Now skip down to verse 11. Let's see what those gifts he's talking about. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. He says may. I love that word there. He says we may grow up. In other words, just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you're going to grow up. It could mean that you've been saved 20, 30, 40, 50 years and you're having to be like uh, changing your diaper with a bed sheet because (laughs) you're still a baby. There's still things that are having to be done for you in your life just like a baby. But he says, no, it's something I want you to do. I want you to grow up. I put these gifts in place to help teach you, to help you grow in faith, help you grow in understanding and application of the word, not just to appease and please your conscience so you'll feel better about yourself throughout the week, but so you can grow and you can face some of these things on your own. Amen? The goal of you sitting here in church today is for you to grab a hold of the truth of God's word and for you to apply it to your lives. There may be a season, there may be a time whenever you need people to come alongside you and teach you and help you along. 
But the goal is not for us to always have to hold your hand, but for you to be able to stand on your own two feet and face pressure, face our adversary, the devil, face whatever situation and whatever junk may be thrown your way, and that you can walk through it in victory because of the word of God that's been invested in you. That's the goal. That's why we're here, to learn God's word, to grow in fellowship with one another and to worship him and honor him. That's why we come together. This isn't a social event. This isn't a country club. This is something that we're supposed to come together to be equipped to grow and to go out into our daily lives and face the pressure with the right pieces put in place so the picture will remain complete. Amen? You see verse 13 in Ephesians 4 in the Amplified Bible says it this way, and I like this. It says that it might develop until we attain oneness in the faith and the comprehension of the full and accurate knowledge of the Son of God, that we might arrive at a really mature manhood, the completeness of personality, which is nothing less than the standard height of Christ's own perfection, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ and the completeness that is found in him. He says, I want you to grow into a maturity. I want you to grow into something where you can stand on your own, where you can grow and walk on your own. And then guess what? You get to invest and pour into others as we continually grow in this process. But this process requires more than Sunday morning. Mm, yes, honey child. I said this process requires more than Sunday morning. It requires a relationship with God. It requires a relationship with God. And the uh, great evangelist from the 1920s, F.F. F. Bosworth, said this. He said, some people wonder why they can't have faith for healing. And he said, they feed their bodies three hot meals a day and their spirit one cold snack per week. And he said, they feed their bodies three times a day, but their spirit, they only feed themselves one cold snack a week. We can't get by on just hoping that we get everything we need just in one church service a week. This is something you and I need to develop our relationship with God and getting to know Him in His Word because it's going to help us to grow and mature into the men and women of God He's called us to be. Amen? Here's what he says in Hebrews chapter 5. Flip over there. We're going to read Hebrews 5 and verse 12. Bible says, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not only solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he's a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, that is those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. He says something here in this verse, and I want you to see it. He says that by reason of use, they have their senses exercised. By reason of use. In other words, they're taking the things that they've been taught, and they're doing something with it. You see, you can listen and listen all day long. You can be able to spout out scriptures. You can know left and right, up and down, backwards, forwards, Hebrew, Greek, Chinese. I don't know however many translations you want to memorize. Unless you actually do something with it, it's just a bunch of knowledge. It's just something you know. I mean, yeah, you might be really great on Jeopardy if they have the Bible trivia on there. Like those questions are hard anyways. <laughs> you might be great at some kind of trivia game, but in life, where this stuff counts, where are these pieces that we're constantly trying to fill these voids with these other pieces that look like they fit, but they don't. You see, we've got to put those right pieces, and we've got to actually take this word and apply it and do something with it, put it in our lives by reason of use. This is the mature ones, the ones that are of full age. Those who, by reason of use, have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. They've been doing the stuff. They've been exercising it. They've been using it by reason of use. You see, the picture is always going to be incomplete, without the right pieces in the right places. I want to show you one more thing here in the book of Psalms in the very first chapter. Psalm 1 and verse 1. I'll give you just a second. I hear some pages turning. Psalm 1. I hear a lot more pages turning. That must encourage some of you who kind of gave up halfway. Like, oh, he's going to read it before I can get there. Why try? 
now that I'm getting a little bit more time, might as well jump in and join the club, right? Go ahead, flip away, people, flip away. <laughs> All right, Psalm 1 and verse 1 says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And, he, and in his law, he meditates day and night. And here's what's going to happen to this guy. Look at this. He shall be like a tree that's planted by rivers of water that brings forth fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall does not wither, and whatever he does is going to prosper. Did you see that? Blesses this guy. First of all, he's not walking in the counsel of the ungodly. He's not hanging around ungodly folks because he knows that if he hangs around them, they're going to influence him. And he also knows that whatever he allows in his life the most is going to come out because he's going to begin to talk like these people. He's going to begin to act like these people. So he doesn't even go and hang out with these people. He doesn't go and get counseling from these people. He goes and seeks after righteous wisdom. He seeks after God's word. And he doesn't stand in the pathway of sinners. He doesn't sit in the seat of the scornful. He doesn't sit in the seat of being better than you and of pointing fingers and telling everybody this is, this is what I think about you and you and you and scorning. But here's what he does. He delights in God's word, in God's law, God's way, God's character. Not only does he delight in it, but he thinks about it. He thinks about it over and over again. He's always meditating on it. And he's thinking about it day and night. It's always on his mind. That guy who is growing, who is understanding God's word and taking it and doing something with it, guess what? He's going to be like a tree that's always connected to a source of life-giving water so it can constantly grow, so it can constantly produce fruit in its season. His leaf isn't going to wither. He's not going to dry up and die because he's connected to that water, that life-giving stream because he's got his roots running deep, because he's planted somewhere where he needs to be. He's got the right pieces in the right place. He's growing. And you know what that tree's going to do whenever the storm comes? It's going to stand. Why? Because its roots are deep. What's going to happen whenever the big wind comes and the pressure is put on? The tree's going to stand because its roots run deep, and it's strong. It's got that strong foundation. You see, God desires for us to grow and mature so whenever the pressures of life are on us, we can handle them the way that God wants us to. So let me ask you today, how do you react when the pressure is on? How do you react? Think about it for just a minute. Think about maybe the pressure was on you this morning or last night or maybe this last week at work. When the pressure was on you, how did you react? What came out of your mouth? What are the things that you said? What, what are the things that you said to other people? What are the things that you said to others about someone? Man, that makes us need to sit back and take a look at what's in our heart. What are we allowing in us the most? Are we taking counsel from the ungodly? Are we sitting in the seat of the scornful? What's going on? Because the stuff is coming out. It's exposing weakness. It's, ex it's exposing immaturity in my life that I need to shore up and strengthen by putting the right pieces in the right places. Here's three things that will help you grow and mature in your walk with God. And I want you to write these three down. Three things that are going to help you grow and mature in your walk with God. Number one, this is a hard one. Spending time with God in prayer and in His Word. Revelation knowledge is pouring from this pulpit this morning. Spending time in prayer with God and in his word, not just hearing it, but applying it. We've got to spend that time with him. And, and maybe it's a, a certain time of the day or, you know, how I spend time with the Lord is just throughout the day. You know, whenever I'm driving to work, I always pray from the time that I leave my house to the time I get to the office. I like to take those alone times in the car and just talk to the Lord. Maybe sometimes I'll pray. Maybe sometimes I'll just talk to him. Maybe sometimes I'll just think about his word and I'll think about him as just strengthening me. It's strengthening who I am. And I'll pray and I'll just talk to the Lord and help me to grow and mature in my walk with him. Here's the second thing. This is a good one. You need to seek godly wisdom from mature believers. Oh, let me say it slow so I can say it some more. I said you need to seek godly wisdom from mature believers. Somebody say, seek godly wisdom from 
mature believers. Here's what we do sometimes, folks. We seek counsel and wisdom from people that are going through the same junk we are. And whenever we do that, we're not helping each other. <laughs> we're not helping each other. I remember that there were uh, some people in our church in Oklahoma, and, uh, and, and this lady was, was really struggling with a lot of issues, struggling with areas in her marriage, struggling in areas uh, with, with alcohol, struggling, struggling in areas with even substance abuse. And you know what? You know who she confided in and would talk to and try to help out of, out of that situation? Somebody who was going through the same exact thing. And they would in turn just try to help each other. And they would have these little meetings all the time and hang out with each other. And they're both dealing with the exact same things. And they're trying to help one another. And they're not going anywhere. They're just running around in circles. The blind are leading the blind. Those that are hurting and struggling. Let me tell you something. You don't go to somebody who sleeps out in a cardboard box and ask them, hey, tell me, how, what's the secret to wealth and success? How do I, how, how do I go out and, and get the best job? How do I go out and be successful in life? You don't do that. We don't go out and ask someone who is broke how to get ahead. We can ask them how not to make mistakes that they made if they've grown from that. But you don't go to someone who is dealing with that issue and ask them how you grow and get free and mature in that area. You don't go and ask someone who's constantly angry and yelling and screaming all the time, how do I deal with anger? (laughs) What kind of stupid question is that? (laughs) You seek godly counsel from mature believers. There was someone in our church in Oklahoma, actually he was a board member, and the guy had done very well financially. He had multiple businesses, and all he had was a high school education. Very, ed- very, very smart guy. Just had a lot of wisdom. He had learned a lot. He had done a lot. He was very wise with money. And guess what I did? I was young. I was very stupid with money. <laughs> I went and hung out with this guy because I said, you know what? I don't, not that I necessarily want to have what he has, but I see something in him that he has learned to take care of money. He's learned to discipline himself. He's learned to apply himself in good ways. I want to learn from this guy. So my wife and I just began to hang out with him. I took this guy out to eat every Tuesday for Chinese food. That was our regular thing. And we went and ate Chinese food every Tuesday. And I began to spend time with him and get to know him. And this guy made such an impact and an investment in my life. Why? He was smarter in this area than I was. He was much more mature in this area than I was. I didn't go to someone who was struggling and say, teach me. I went to someone who I saw had been through a few things and teach me about your struggles so I can avoid some of the traps and pitfalls and I can grow myself and my understanding. That's how we need to be in our relationships. So that's why church is so important. You know, Hebrews 10 and 25, it says, don't forsake the gathering uh, together of yourselves. He says, especially as you see the day approaching, the day of the Lord is coming back. He said, don't forsake that assembling, that gathering together. Why? Because we need each other to help one another to grow. You don't think church is important? You better believe me, it's more important now more than ever because as we get closer to the day, the time whenever Jesus is coming back, we need to constantly have one another here to help us to grow, to move forward, to link arms, to link hearts, amen? Amen. We need one another. And the last thing that's gonna help you grow and mature in your walk with God is experience. It's that simple. Because as we walk in God's word, we learn to trust him and he proves himself faithful and it helps our faith to grow. We get a few stories of our own. Anybody in this place got a story? You got something that you could say, you know what, I've been through this, or I've been through that, and God's proven himself faithful. God's done this in my life. God's done that in my life. Guess what? You've got a story. You've got some experience. You've seen God. You've seen his love. You've seen his forgiveness. You've seen his mercy. You've seen his restoration. You've seen him do things that you know there's no denying that it could be anything else other than the hand of God moving in your situation and in your life. We've all got stories. That experience will help us to grow. And that's one that you can't rush and you can't force. It's just part of the process. Experience. So we need to spend time with God in prayer and in his word, seek godly counsel from mature believers, and we need to allow our experiences with God to become milestones and markers in our lives that we can prove the faithfulness of God in our own lives. Amen? Philippians 4 and 10. It's the last scripture I'm going to read to you this morning. Philippians 4 and 10 through verse 13 says, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now... At last you care for me. 
your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I've learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. And I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You see, this is the Apostle Paul here writing to the Philippian church. And there's a situation where they're not able to give him the offering that necessarily they thought that he should be able to get. And he tells him, you know what? I, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that you did take care of me. He said, but listen, don't worry about it because I've learned how to do with things and I've learned how to do without things. I've learned how to praise God and rejoice and serve God while shackled up in chains in a prison. I've learned how to trust God whenever I was abandoned and shipwrecked. I've learned how to trust God whenever people were chasing after me trying to take my life. Oh, and I've learned how to trust in Him and to serve Him whenever I was dining with kings and whenever I was in important places of influence and everyone thought well of me. I've learned how to be abased, but I've also learned how to abound. And guess what? I've learned through all of these things. I've learned how to be hungry and both to suffer need, but... I can do all of this, not because I'm so great, not because I'm so special, but it's because Christ in me gives me strength to do this. Christ in me. He was saying, I've learned to react in a way that trust in God, because trusting in God gives me the strength I need. The pieces that you have been looking for to complete the picture in your life are found in your walk, in your relationship with God, and in His Word. How do you react when the pressure is on? How are we going to react whenever the pressure is on? Look at Paul. He said, when the pressure was on, I know how to react. I know I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Anybody can rejoice and praise God whenever everything's going great. But what about whenever the pressure is on? Paul says, I've learned how to do that too. Everywhere and in all things, I've learned both to be full and to be hungry. I've learned to abound and to suffer need. I can do this. Because Christ in me, my trust in Him, my reaction to the pressure, reacting correctly, reacting as a mature believer, reacting as trusting in Him, it strengthens me. It gives me strength. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen? Amen. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do this week. I want you to take that first chapter in that book of Psalms. And I want you to read it. And I don't want you to just read it one time and go, oh, well, I did my homework for the week. <laughs> I want you to read it and I want you to think on it. I want you to meditate on it. I want you to take that Psalm chapter 1 and I want you to read If you need to read it daily, read it daily. If you need to think on it daily, think on it daily. I want you to get this down into your heart, who you really are. Get in your core because guess what? When the pressure is on, whatever's in you the most is going to come out. So why not start by putting the right pieces in the right places so whenever the pressure does come on, because I got news for you, it's coming. Woohoo! It's coming. What are you going to do? How are you going to react whenever the pressure is on? It's whatever you put in you the most. So let's start putting his word in our hearts. Let's start meditating on, thinking on his word. Think on that Psalm chapter one. Read it. It's just a few verses. It's not going to take you long. You might want to take a little index card and write it down and put it on your desk at work or put it in your car to where you can read it or put it somewhere on the refrigerator where you can see it and read it and think on it. Think, I want to be like that tree that's planted by the river of living water that's roots run deep, that fruit is always in season that never withers, and that can withstand any storm because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen? Bow your heads with me this morning. Maybe you're here and you say, Pastor Derek, I need to trust in God more. I need to trust in Him like you're talking about because there's this emptiness in my life. There's this missing pieces in my life. And I'm ready to put the right pieces in the right places. And for you, that may be as simple as saying, I need Jesus in my life. Maybe you've never prayed to accept him as your Lord and Savior. Maybe you've never really trusted in him. Or maybe you trusted in him for a season, but then you've kind of fallen away and you say, I want to renew my trust in him. And if that's you, and if you're here, I just want you to simply let me know that you're here by lifting up your hand and putting it back down. I see that hand. You can put it right back down. I see that hand. Anybody else in this place? 
anybody else. I don't want to miss anybody. Give you an opportunity. I see that hand. Anybody else? Thank you, Jesus. Church, would you join me and say this prayer? Dear Jesus, I trust you. I want to make you the Lord of my life. You are my Savior. You are my Lord. You're my leader. What you did on the cross was good enough to redeem me back into right standing with God. I trust you, Jesus, with all my heart, and I commit my life to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Lord.